Welcome to episode 156 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to share five syndromes that overcomplicate your teaching and the cure for each one. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript or to share your thoughts in the comments. Thank you to Advancement Courses for sponsoring today's show. You can earn graduate credits or CEUs through over 200 online PD courses in 19 different subject areas. Everything is online and entirely self-paced. And right now you can save 20% off each course with code TRUTH20. To learn more, visit advancementcourses.com slash truth. So my new book is coming out on April 10th. I am so excited. It's called Fewer Things Better, The Courage to Focus on What Matters Most. And I'm doing like the final read throughs right now before releasing it. And when I was going through, when I had time to like sit down and actually read the whole thing from start to finish, I realized that I talk a lot about some different syndromes throughout the book. And these are mindsets that overcomplicate our teaching. These are things that make it harder to say no and draw boundaries or that prevent us from doing the most impactful work. These syndromes create overwhelm. And I thought it would make a really cool podcast episode to pull out each of those five syndromes from the book and talk here about how those things might be holding you back. So I'm going to include some excerpts from the book here, and then I'll just sort of riff off of them. So let's start with shiny object syndrome. Some teachers find themselves perpetually chasing shiny objects, that next new exciting trend that they think is going to transform their teaching. Some of it may be because they're just easily bored and they like to look for something you know new and fresh to keep teaching exciting. They might be feeling pressure from the district or pressure from colleagues who are very innovative. It might just be FOMO, fear of missing out, right? Just being worried about being stuck in the dark ages when everyone around them is doing something you know, new and cool and interesting. But shiny object syndrome can be a big distraction and it can really cost you a lot of time and create exhaustion as well. The cure is to remind yourself that, of course, you're missing out on some cool stuff. If you had a million years, you still wouldn't have enough time to teach every awesome lesson idea that's possible. But you don't have to spend excessive time thinking about all the things you could be doing if what you're already doing is working well for you and your students. Consider where your time and energy is best spent and be intentional about what you prioritize. When you find an activity that works, you can repeat those types of experiences over and over. I use the same 20-ish, probably, types of practice activities in many different contexts, and I only deviated from them when the subject matter lent itself to that. So if I was teaching about moon cycles, obviously we built cycles of the moon. But for most skills and topics, I was simply picking and choosing from what I already knew was effective. So for example, gallery walks, which are also called chat stations, are one teaching strategy that I have relied on a lot in the classroom. Students work in small groups to walk around the room and they respond to texts or quotes or questions, prompts, something like that, that I've placed around various parts of the room. This activity is versatile and naturally differentiated. It can be used with any topic. It gets kids moving around and collaborating. They love it and it's minimal prep. So gallery walks are a go-to activity in my teaching bag of tricks. If I want kids to think and talk about a topic, I don't need to spend an hour online looking for some clever new way to do it. I can simply write gallery walk in my lesson plans, and then the next day, I tell kids that's what they're doing, and they know to spring into action. That means there's no wasted time reinventing the wheel on my weekends. And there's no wasted class time explaining what to do, setting expectations, practicing procedures, creating new routines. So if lesson planning takes you way too much time, this is the way you want to plan the bulk of your activities. You can start with four to five strategies that you know are effective for your students and add more slowly over time. Now, this doesn't mean that you can never look for something new to try. If finding fun activities is part of your hobby work that you do in your free time, that's great. 
And that's a topic that I talk about actually a lot in the book is distinguishing between the work that you don't mind doing, that you enjoy doing because it's fun for you and the work that you really want to cut back on and minimize. So if you love looking for new activities, go for it. I'm just saying you don't have to do it in order to be an effective teacher. There are lots of ways to keep things fresh and interesting. Don't allow yourself to fall prey to shiny object syndrome in which you're distracted by every new to you teaching idea. Focus on what works and let go of the pressure to constantly be doing something new. Next up is imposter syndrome. And I've talked about this on the podcast before. If this is something that you struggle with, I have an entire episode about that where I go into more depth. But it's something really important that I, that I want to mention here as well. Because even if your students are generally learning and engaged, even if parents are complimenting you, even if colleagues admire you and your principal thinks you're doing a good job, you still might not see yourself as an effective teacher. And that's going to lead to all kinds of issues where you're constantly overworking and overcomplicating things for yourself. Imposter syndrome is where you feel sort of like a fraud. You have this almost panic inducing sense that at any moment, other people are going to figure out you have absolutely no idea what you're doing. So you might have thoughts like, I'm not experienced or knowledgeable enough to be doing this work. I don't know why people say I'm such a good teacher. I don't really deserve it. I haven't done a good job. The cure for imposter syndrome is to build up your sense of self-worth and learn to truly recognize your skills and accomplishments. And that's because the problem isn't that other people think that you're better than you actually are. They're not wrong about your competency. The issue is that they think you're better than you think you are. Their view of you is higher than your view of yourself. So imposter syndrome isn't rooted in reality. It's not about your actual skills or expertise at all. It's rooted in the way you see yourself. If you've accomplished things that are greater than your own perception of self-worth, you'll experience cognitive dissonance anytime you're praised. Like, how could I be teacher of the year when my desk is a mess and I have 500 unread emails? Why would they want me to be team leader if I yelled at my students the other day? How could my colleagues compliment my room organization when everything inside my cabinets is a disaster? Because you don't measure up to some internal ideal, you don't feel like a good enough teacher. And so when others compliment your achievements and skills, it feels uncomfortable. It doesn't align with your identity. If you want to be able to create boundaries for yourself and stand up for your needs and be firm in what you believe, you have to fight this imposter syndrome head on. You have to develop the confidence to be yourself unapologetically without letting other people's expectations define you. And getting there means understanding your strengths and knowing what you bring to the table. This is so critical. Actually, there's a whole section of the book dedicated to that to explain how to redevelop that confidence in your teaching when you have so many people questioning you or criticizing you or cutting you down and telling you conflicting things. How can you really figure out what your authentic teaching style is and stand strong in it and say no when people are asking you to do things that aren't what's best for you and your students? So let's move on to the third syndrome that might be overcomplicating your teaching. It's called project manager syndrome. I think it's a well-known fact or trope that teachers wear many hats. You play the role of secretary, nurse, social worker, counselor, and so on. But there's another role that needs to be filled, and you might not even be aware of it. And that is one of a project manager. Your school or district leader set the goals, but you are in charge of figuring out systems and daily procedures for getting kids from point A to B in their development. In other words, someone in charge tells you what needs to be done, and perhaps in excruciating, micromanaging detail, but you must figure out how to ensure that everything that's required actually happens. Not only are you figuring out systems and routines and procedures, you're also responsible for completing the vast majority of work all by yourself. You're giving the learning standards and are responsible for orchestrating how to get every single child to meet those standards. That's not a single task that you can just put on a to-do list and check off. It is an absolutely massive, ongoing project. And that's why lesson planning is so challenging and time intensive. You have to design, research, manage, oversee, implement, evaluate the project, 
and you do it all pretty much single-handedly. You don't have someone to manage the project for you. And lesson planning is just one type of project you're in charge of, right? There's lots of other things on your plate. Then you go home and you repeat that same process for all your personal and household tasks too. So you're planning and executing all day long. That obligation to make sure that everything's running smoothly and everyone's happy and nothing is forgotten, it never ends. You never get a break from it. I refer to this kind of emotional labor and this kind of mental load as project manager syndrome. It's where you feel responsible for planning and orchestrating every detail of your life and the lives of those in your care. And I think it's one of the most insidious forms of burnout because we have trouble recognizing it in ourselves. We have trouble explaining the stress to others. Many of the responsibilities don't seem very big on their own, so we don't feel like we should complain. But it's the cumulative weight that's exhausting. It's the sheer number of items to keep track of. There might be 30 or more things to oversee just in the minor detail of your student's day. So in the back of your mind, you're thinking, okay, remember to send Sarah to the speech therapist at 1015. Get Jacob to the nurse for his asthma medication at 1130. Give the homework assignment to Lachey right before lunch because she's leaving early. Make sure Mario has that extra copy of the study guide that his mom wanted. Print out the recommendation letter for Justine. Oh, have Chloe check the lost and found for the hat she can't find. This is what's happening in a teacher's brain all the time, right? The cure for project management syndrome involves turning over the responsibility for doing many of these tasks to other people so that you're not carrying the mental load of trying to remember and oversee everything. And that doesn't mean just sharing the work. It's turning over the whole responsibility for remembering things, both at home and in the classroom, so that you're not the one solely in charge. Now, there's another syndrome that plays into this one, and it might be holding you back as well. So let me talk about this next one also, and then we'll address the cure for both of them together. The next syndrome is called superhero syndrome. And this is a phenomenon in which people are unwilling to ask for help because they think no one else could be capable of doing things the way they need to be done. This has been a really big struggle for me in all areas of my life and my work. And chances are good that you have struggled in very similar ways with just carrying too much of the workload. So maybe your superhero syndrome sounds like this. I can't ask my partner to do the dishes because I don't like the way he loads a dishwasher. I can't ask my students to organize our class library because it won't look right if they do it. I can't co-plan with my teammates because they don't do things the way that I want to do them. These kinds of excuses go on and on and on, and it just adds to our workload until it becomes overwhelming. You don't exist as an island, but you've isolated yourself when it comes to getting things done. When you have superhero syndrome, you've taken on that responsibility for all these tasks, which other people around you are fully capable of doing. You don't want to owe your coworkers, so you don't ask them for anything. You don't trust your family members to be responsible, so you bear the full weight of keeping the household on track. You don't want to take time to train your students to clean and organize and manage the learning environment or keep track of their own missing assignments, so you stay on top of everything for them. It's superhero syndrome that makes you feel like you are the only one who can do things the way they need to be done. You know the old saying, right? If you want something done right, do it yourself. That is the motto of a person with superhero syndrome. That is not healthy. (laughs) Don't believe the lie that it's easier to do everything yourself than to train someone else or to allow other people to do things in their own way and not worry about it. Guess what? As long as you are the only one who can do things quote unquote right, you are the only one who will ever be doing them. If you want to expand your capacity to achieve more, or if you even just want to shorten your to-do list, you have to adapt the same mindset that I have needed to adapt and begin sharing the workload. That's the only cure. No, your family members and students, colleagues, other people will not be able to do things exactly like you do them. But 80% done by them is better than 100% done by you. You might have to explain the task and train them and get them started, which is like the first 10%. 
and you might have to do the final 10% yourself to clean up any errors or put the final touch on things. But if the middle 80% can be delegated, that's 80% less work for you. Even 40% done by someone else is better than 100% done by you. Don't allow your own standards for how things should be done to keep you stuck in a place where you can never delegate or get assistance. In the Fewer Things Better book, I share a lot more specifics about this delegation process, how to overcome perfectionistic or controlling tendencies, how to let go of sacred cows and these beliefs that we have about how things have to be done. It's a lot to it. If it were as easy as just turning things over to someone else, all of us would have a more manageable workload, right? Like there's a lot of mindset shifts that have to happen in there. So there's more to it than this. And there's definitely a lot in the book that will go into specifics about that. But for now, I want to move on to the fifth and final syndrome that overcomplicates your teaching, which is martyr syndrome. The competition for martyrdom is something that is ingrained in educators from the very first day of our teacher training programs. We are told repeatedly by everyone around us that we will never make a lot of money in this profession while also being told that teaching is the most important profession in the world. We are groomed from the start to accept that we will always be undervalued and underpaid. And the tacit implication is that we must be okay with that sacrifice if we really care about kids. These are the subconscious beliefs that comprise our collective teaching identity. The more I pile onto my plate, the more dedicated of a teacher I am. The harder the teaching job, the more it proves that I care about kids. The worse the working conditions I endure, the tougher I am and the more worthy of respect I am. These are the beliefs that make the savior complex such a common problem amongst teachers. We feel pressured to do whatever it takes to rescue kids. We're conditioned to see ourselves as the hero of kids' stories instead of seeing kids as the heroes of their own stories. Not only will a savior complex harm your students, it'll also really wear you out. It's impossible to create better balance when you feel responsible for saving kids and you need to constantly prove how much you're doing to help them and feel like you need to be this martyr for the cause. A savior or hero's entire identity is wrapped up in saving the victims. Nothing else matters. It must get done at any physical, emotional, or financial cost. But here's the cure. You can change your identity from savior to supporter. You can withdraw from this contest for most dedicated teacher in the most difficult teaching job ever. And in fact, that's the critical piece of this transformation. If you think that taking the toughest teaching job and working endless hours is necessary to prove that you care to be a real teacher, then any improvement in your workload will always be impossible. Cutting back on anything is going to make you feel less dedicated to kids, and you will constantly be comparing yourself to other teachers who sacrifice more. You'll feel guilty for not sacrificing as much as they do. You won't be able to follow through on steps to simplify until that no longer conflicts with your identity as someone who must do anything for the kids and be hard at work every minute to prove your worth. Being overworked, underpaid, and unappreciated and yet continuing to give 110% every day, that is our collective identity as educators. And we're all hardwired to reject changes that don't fit with our identities. So if you wanna shift away from these martyr syndromes and really any of the syndromes that we've talked about today, it might be time to ask yourself some of the questions that I've had to grapple with too. Like, do I want people to agree that I have a terribly hard job with completely unreasonable demands? Or do I want to enjoy my work? Do I want the satisfaction that comes from seeing myself as a martyr? Or do I want to figure out what my needs are and make sure they're met? Do I want to win the hardest job in the world award? Or do I want to live a fulfilling, well-balanced life? You have to get real about what you want and decide if you're actually motivated to change, to move away from these syndromes. Because sometimes we don't really want things to improve. We just want to wallow. 
We want to talk about how awful and difficult things are and have other people commiserate and admire us for all the hardship that we manage to endure. I have been there. And it's okay for you to be there too. Just don't stay stuck there. At any point in time, you can decide to stop repeating to yourself how exhausting everything is and let go of excuses for why your life could never be any different. You can stop measuring your worth by what other people think of you and by how much you do for others. You can disassociate the number of hours you work with your perception of effectiveness and dedication. When you shift those beliefs, you create space to be intentional about how you use your unpaid time. You can begin to focus more on what matters instead of trying to keep up with what everyone else appears to be doing. It is a myth that every teacher has to work endless unpaid hours to do a great job for kids. The truth is that working more hours does not equate with more effectiveness. It's what you do with the hours that makes a difference. And that's probably the best summary of the book I can give. I would love for you to go to fewerthingsbetter.com to learn more and to make sure you get a copy. Have a great week. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.